Hello everyone and welcome to Research Methods Lesson 8 where we are going to be looking at observational research. So just so that everybody is aware, this video is going to be split into two parts. Part 1 is going to focus on what observations are and the different types of observations and Part 2 is going to focus on designing observational research and the intricacies that are involved with that. If you're more interested in the second video, or if you've already seen this video and you need the second one, then the link should be appearing on your screen right about now, but it'll also appear at the end as well. So either way, you are good to go. So up until now, in research methods, we focused mainly on the experimental method, which is effectively how to conduct experiments. We've looked at IVs and DVs, we've looked at experimental designs and types of experiments, and we've looked at ethics and sampling, all of which make up the backbone of traditional experimental research. However, the experimental method might not always provide the most suitable way to study a particular behaviour, and because of that, there are also a number of non-experimental methods available to psychologists, one of which is observations. The reason they're called non-experimental is because they don't actually allow us to determine cause and effect. However, that being said, observations are a very nice way of seeing what people do without actually having to ask them. It also allows researchers to study observable behaviour within a natural or a controlled setting, and it allows researchers to study more complex interactions between variables in a very natural way. As a side note, observations are very often used within an experiment as a way for researchers to assess a dependent variable. Now, as a general rule, observations fall into three categories. They are either naturalistic or controlled, overt or covert, and participant or non-participant. And in this video, we're going to have a look at what all of those mean. So let's make a start with naturalistic versus controlled. A naturalistic observation takes place in a setting where the behavior would naturally occur. In that sense, all aspects of the situation are free to vary. An example of a naturalistic observation would be something like investigating the interactions between managers and employees. It wouldn't make sense to observe that in a controlled setting. It makes more sense to observe that in the setting in which it would usually occur. For example, the workplace. A controlled observation, on the other hand, is a type of observation where elements are controlled, hence the name. For example, the strange situation, which is an attachment piece of research, which you'll come across when you've done the attachment topic. So, in the strange situation, researchers observe infants playing with their mothers in a controlled, specifically designed playroom. The observers watch via a two-way mirror so they don't get involved, and elements of the situation are controlled, which then reduces the impact of unwanted variables. Moving on, we have covert versus overt observations. Now this effectively means that either the participants know they're being observed or they don't know they're being observed. Covert observations involve participants being unaware that they're part of a study and that means they're generally being observed from something like across a room or from a balcony or from a bench in the city centre or something like that. In a covert observation behaviours must be public and must be happening anyway if it's going to be ethical. If that is the case, behaviour is allowed to be recorded without first gaining consent. In an overt observation, participants know that they're part of a study and they've given informed consent beforehand. So for example, coming back to the strange situation, the parents knew that they were part of an observation. Okay, and then finally, we have participant versus non-participant observations. So essentially what this means is that either the researcher is taking part in the study or is watching from the sidelines. So as an example, our management and workforce study from earlier might be improved if the researcher actually joins the workforce to produce a first-hand account of the thing that they're studying. However, in a non-participant observation, the researcher remains separate from those that they're studying and records the behaviour in a more objective way. Non-participant observations are often used when it's impractical or even impossible to join a particular group. So as an example, researchers are often interested in the behaviour of children when they first start school. However, 
In this situation, it would be impractical and more importantly, inappropriate for the researcher to join the children in actually playing. So in that case, non-participant observations are the only option. So those are your three types of observation. As a general rule, all observations will be one of each three types. So for example, an observation might be controlled, overt, and non-participant. So now I'm gonna move on to a couple of evaluation points, but don't forget this is research methods, and so evaluation points tend to be quite short. So first off, let's have a look at naturalistic and controlled observations. For this, we're going to focus on external validity and replication. In a naturalistic observation, there are high levels of external validity because the research has been conducted in a natural setting. Therefore, it gives us an insight of how the behavior will occur in the real world. However, naturalistic settings are very hard to replicate due to the fact that there are a lot of variables that can't be controlled. On the other hand, controlled observations are very readily replicable because they do allow a lot of control over variables, which means it's much easier to repeat the study. However, that increase of control comes with a lack of external validity. So, naturalistic observations have got good external validity, but are very hard to replicate, and controlled observations have the exact opposite, good replication and bad external validity. Moving on, covert versus overt observations, and here we are going to focus on internal validity and ethics. So covert observations have good internal validity because the fact that participants don't know that they're being observed removes the issue of demand characteristics and participant reactivity. That means that participants are going to act naturally because they don't know that they're being studied. However, ethics could be an issue in covert observations because even though the behavior is occurring in a public place, doesn't necessarily mean that people want their behavior observed and recorded. For example, shopping is a public activity. However, how much I spend on a shopping spree is my own private business. Therefore, we have to be a little bit careful with ethics. Overt observations don't have this issue as much because people know that they're being observed and have given informed consent beforehand. However, that also means that their behavior could be impacted, which reduces the internal validity. And then finally, we have participant versus non-participant observations. So here we're going to focus on validity and objectivity. So experiencing the situation with the participants in a participant observation gives researchers greater insight into the behaviors that they are studying. It allows them to see the intricacies of that behavior in very great detail, and that then provides greater validity for the findings. That's something that non-participant observations lack. However, participant observations could also result in researchers identifying too strongly with the participants, which then could result in a reduction of objectivity. That's something that's called going native, and that is effectively when the lines between researcher and participant become blurred. It's much easier to maintain objectivity as a non-participant because you're observing from the outside. But that being said, the trade-off is that the insight that you may gain from being a participant is lost because you're too far removed from what it is that you are studying. Okay, so that is the end of part one. Part two should be appearing on your screens right about now, so go ahead and click on that when you're ready to do so. If you're looking for exam questions on this, then they'll be at the end of part two, because the end of part two is effectively when we will have finished the observations topic. Okay, so if you need those, just go ahead and click on the link and head over to video two. I hope it's all made sense, and I hope it's been useful, and thank you very much for listening. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.